Okay, let's begin. Uh, first of all, today is the Valentine's Day. Sevgililer günü. So, happy Valentine to you all. I hope you spend your life with someone that you love. There used to be no such days, but I guess the capitalist world tries to uh, consume a lot of <laughs> just to promote consumption. Uh, they just invent these days, in my judgment. Nevertheless, it's good to, of course, be with, uh, with your loved ones. Uh, uh, the uh, lectures that we're uh, holding this semester, they are, they are being put into the uh, video section of the website of Bill Kent. So the first two weeks are already in. In case you miss something, and if you want to review the lecture, you can take a look at it. Okay? I should also take a look at it and see what I look like in the pictures. I hope I look okay. All right, uh, I guess today uh, we're going to talk about the fourier matskin elimination. That, that's something that I told you that I would talk about last week, except that we did not have enough time for that in discussion of the requirement space. The fourier matskin elim elimination is initially discovered by Fourier, the well-known Fourier of the Fourier transforms. This was back in 1820s, and I think it was 1823 as far as I remember. Could be a little bit different. And this was a way of solving, obtaining a solution to linear inequality systems. Then Fourier did not really, well, he just developed the method and he published it. Uh, it's a two-page two note. It's, it's not really something terribly difficult. He just gives out the main ideas without really going into deep uh, theoretical analysis. It was forgotten for quite a while in 1935 or so, Matzkin, another uh, well-known mathematician, almost rediscovered it or revived it. So that's why we use the term fourier matzkin rather than just Fourier. Okay? It was independently conceived of uh, by Matzkin as well. Uh, there are some papers on this, actually quite a few papers. Uh, if you want to, you know, do some research on this later on for whatever reason, you just come and see me and I can probably uh, direct you to some of the papers. Now, what's the idea? The idea behind all of this is the following. If you have a linear inequality system of the form AX less or equal to B, including non-negativity and whatever, all kinds of inequalities. Let's just assume you have n variables and whatever number of uh, inequalities in the initial system. What you do is you eliminate variables one at a time. So you take, the, say, the first variable, and then you do some operations on the first variable, on the coefficients of the first variable to obtain a second system, which involves only the set of variables from x2 up to the last one. So the first one is gone. And then you do similar kinds of operations for the second variable. And then you obtain a third system, which is again reduced by 1. It involves only variables x3 through the last one. So you just keep going like this, as long as, of course, uh, the system you obtain, the last system you obtain, allows you to continue. And then, finally, you end up with inequalities involving a single variable. Now, once you have a single variable system, 
And if, uh, if you've got all inequalities, it's easy to solve that. What do you do? It will involve each inequality will correspond to either an upper bound on the variable or a lower bound on the variable, depending on if the coefficient in front of the variable is positive or negative. Okay? So you just take all the upper bounds, you take all the lower bounds. Of the upper bounds, the smallest one is the effective one. Of the lower bounds, the largest one is the effective one. And then you see if the smallest of the upper bounds is larger or equal to, larger than or equal to the largest of the lower bounds. Okay? If this is satisfied, then there's room for x, the last variable, to have, uh, to take on a numerical value. If this is not the case, if its effective upper bound is smaller than its effective lower bound, obviously it's empty. There is no solution for the last variable. So you can conclude the case when there is no feasible solution to the initial system uh, by doing this, by, uh, by just simply inspecting the last system involving the last variable. If that one admits a feasible solution, then of course the, uh, the former systems that you've obtained along the way, they also admit a solution including the initial one. If the last one does not admit a feasible solution, depending on the uh, 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 bounds, then in that case, of course, the initial system does not admit a solution either. Okay? So that's the idea. But how do we proceed about this? I'm going to illustrate that uh, with a numerical example, but first we'll talk about the general way of attacking these things. This is, in a sense, similar in spirit to the Gaussian elimination, except that, or Gauss-Jordan elimination. The Gaussian elimination is used for systems of equations. Now, equations are quite different in their nature uh, from inequality systems. When you've got equations, you can take for example, in Gaussian elimination, you can take one variable, say the first one, express it using the first equation, for example, in terms of the remaining variables. And then whatever you've got for x1 in terms of the remaining variables, you take that expression, substitute it in the remaining equations wherever you see your x1. So this way, you eliminate x1 from the entire system by using one of the equations. Of course, you cannot do the same thing here because we, substitution will not work here. Okay? That's why you have to work with bounds uh, at the end. Well, along the way, actually, you also work with bounds, uh, even though people don't recognize that that's the case. But I'm going to uh, point that out as we go along. So this is the system. Suppose. We want to eliminate x1 from this system, and we want to obtain a new system, say a prime x in the remaining variables, x prime, one of them is eliminated, less than or equal to b prime. In general, when you do these eliminations, the number of inequalities on hand will grow in size, will grow in number. In fact, they grow quite fast exponentially. Many of these inequalities could be or will be in general redundant, but we're not interested in that right now. We're not interested in computational efficiency. As far as computational efficiency, this is not an efficient method. However, it's a conceptually a good method and it's good for uh, anyone working on linear programming to be familiar with this method. So how do we eliminate x1? First of all, we look at <coughs> the constraints involving x1. If you look at the ith constraint, it will have a coefficient ai1, x1, where ai1 could be positive, negative, or zero, of course. <coughs> Plus, you've got the rest of the variables, ai2, x2, up to the last one. And 
indeed, we assume all the inequalities are of less than or equal to type. So this is less than or equal to bi. You've got, say, m such inequalities. Okay. Now, depending on what we have here as a coefficient for x1, we're going to operate differently. To operate differently, I'm going to take the set of constraint indices, say 1 through m, in the initial system. I'm going to split this into three parts. The first subset, I sub plus, includes all those constraint indices where the coefficient of x1 is positive. AI1 is positive. The second one is the set of all constraint indices where the coefficient of x1 is negative. AI1. And the last one is, of course, the set of constraint indices for which AI1 is equal to 0. Okay. Now, some of those subsets could be empty. Nevertheless, uh, at least one of them will be non-empty because we've got a non-empty set here. All right. So what we do here is the following. For the case I belonging to I plus, so I'm going to, I can rewrite the same thing for I plus union I minus union I zero, okay? Oops, that's a union. <clears throat> All right, let's take the case when I belongs to the plus set. In that case, AI1 is positive, which means that X1 is actually less than or equal to 1 over AI1 into BI minus the stuff in the parentheses. Okay. This is for all those i that belong to the plus set. For the minus set, we're going to do the same thing. Except that when you divide both sides of the inequality after transferring the parenthetical quantity to the right side, you're dividing by the coefficient. If the coefficient is negative, the sense of the inequality reverses. So for that reason, for i belonging to i minus, we are going to have the reverse inequality, x1 greater or equal 1 over ai1 into bi minus ai2 x2 ain xn. Okay. Now, what about the rest? I belonging to I not. In that case, of course, the coefficient is already zero. In that case, you don't do anything. You simply write a i two x two up to a i n x n less than or equal to b i for i in i zero. Okay. Now, this is not in quite the format that I want yet. Nevertheless, this is the start of what we wish to do. We want to manipulate these a little bit, x1. We want to eliminate x1. Now, just think of it this way. If there's a feasible solution to the initial system, then there must be a choice of the variables x2 through xn, such that all of these bounds are satisfied, as well as all of the lower bounds are satisfied, which means that each upper bound here should be at least as large as each lower bound here. 
otherwise there will be no such feasible solution okay so you want to require that each upper bound coming from the plus set be greater or equal each lower bound coming from the minus set if that does not make sense right now you should go home and study until it makes sense to you otherwise you know things will be different because that's the conceptual part uh, the rest is just mechanical you know technical stuff so all we do is we take this system and we require that each lower bound 1 over ai1 bi minus ai2 x2 up to AIN XN B uh, that's the upper bound so let me take this as the lower bound let's take the other one as the upper bound A K 1 let's change the index from I to K because we're going to consider each pair of upper and lower bounds okay A K 1 B sub K minus A K 2 X 2 up to the last one A K N X N all right you require this for each I in I minus and each K in I plus each upper bound being greater or equal each lower bound plus of course you should not forget this you should also include that ai2 x2 ai n x n less or equal bi for i belonging to i naught okay so this system is the same as that system with x1 eliminated all right now you need to simplify this because this looks complicated with all these you know 1 over ai's so let's do that when you simplify this all you have to do is multiply both sides by the product of ai1 and ak1 so that you get rid of the fractional look here okay and so what you would get it and then you put the constants on the right side and take the variables on the left side and that's what you got so you will get ak1 times ai2 minus ai1 times a k2 that's my coefficient for x2 variable okay multiplying ai1 with this ak1 with that meanwhile you're reversing the inequality because ai1 is a negative number for that reason this reverses so after multiplying the left side by ak1 multiplying the right side by ai minus 1 and reversing the inequality uh, I want to have everything in less than or equal to form so the reversal of the inequality tells me that I want to keep ai1 times ak2 x2 in its proper or in its, uh, in its uh, uh, present sign whereas this one ak1 times ai2 will be negative but you take it to the right side because you want everything to be you know variables to be on this side so it becomes positive so in case you don't follow that that's not really too important you can work it out at home okay I kind of do these things uh, in my head at least I try to sometimes it's easy to make a mistake so if I make a mistake you point that out to me okay all right that's the coefficient for x2 you do the same thing for x3 so on and so forth and the last one now what do I have here I'm going to have ak1 x i n 
minus a i. What is that? No. Uh, a i one yes times a k n right okay. Thank you for helping me out. Looks too complicated to me sometimes when I look at it. If I look at things from a distance, it's easier to see. If you look at them right here, it's hard, you know, sometimes. I don't know why. There's a mistake? Let me just check. It will be AI1 times AKN. AI1 times AKN, that's correct, with the negative sign. And then AK1 times AIN, AK1 times AIN. This looks correct. Oh, oh, I see. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's an A. See, I don't see it even though I look at it. <laughs> Sometimes your mind tells you something, your hand does something else, you know. All right, on the right side, what do we have? We have AK1 times BI. And then, let's worry about the signs in a little bit. AI1 times BK. Now, I had the reversal of the inequality, so this constant will go to the left side, so I want a negative there, okay? The other one just stays where it is. So, this is the set of inequalities for everything in I minus, I in I minus, and K in I plus plus AI2, X2 up to AIN, XN less than or equal to BI for I in I naught. All right, so I'm not going to go any further. You simply take these coefficients, define them to be whatever you want to do. For example, the coefficient of x2 in the ith equation, just make it say bar, so it's different now. Uh, you can define this to be similarly, AIN. And you can just give a new name to this, call it say, uh, so this will be some uh, equation defined by I and K combination. So you might want to call it BIK, or you may just renumber these pairs from what one up to whatever, R, and then just give the name B sub R var to it, okay? So let's just do that, maybe that's easier, okay? Because the combination IK corresponds to a single index R in the new system, okay? By renumbering. All right. And then you apply the same thing to the second variable, so on and so on. You just keep going until, as I said, you finally obtain an inequality system in a single variable. Once you've, okay, let's return that. So you keep going until you finally obtain alpha 1 or, yeah, alpha 1 xn. Let's suppose xn is the last variable that survived. It's got, say, t inequalities of the form, whatever you want to call them. Let's call them beta 1 up to beta n, uh, beta t, sorry. Okay, t inequalities at the end. That system. Now, over here, you partition the index set, say, j, from 1 to t, 
into again three parts j sub plus j sub minus j sub zero and through that if you rewrite the inequality system what do you get? You get xn less than or equal to beta i over alpha i for i in i plus okay that's the plus set the, the definitions are similar so I did not write them down but this is the set of i going from 1 to t such that alpha i is positive the coefficient is positive this is the set of i for which alpha i is less than zero and this last one is i such that alpha i is zero so the system we've got here through these index partitions can be rewritten in the following way What is the signal for inconsistency here? The first signal. There are two signals. This last one gives you the first signal. You've got 0 times x and less than or equal to beta i. If it so happens that beta i is a negative number, then 0 will not be less than or equal to a negative number. So in that case, you have infeasibility. Okay, so look for that. If it so happens that bi is non-negative for every i belonging to i naught, we're okay as far as that part is concerned because regardless of what value you assign to xn, zero will be less than or equal to bi in that, beta i in that case. Okay, so you might want to take a note of that. Beta i is less than zero. The problem or the inequality system at the beginning is infeasible because you cannot satisfy the last one. If beta i is non negative for every i in i naught, then the inequality system may or may not be feasible. It depends on the remaining set of inequalities. So in the latter case, we focus on the last system. It will be feasible if each bound, each upper bound here, coming from the plus side, is greater or equal each lower bound here. So you want uh, the maximum beta i over alpha i, i in i minus, to be not greater than the minimum of the lower bounds. That's not zero. What is this? This is i minus. Sorry, change that. And this is i plus. Okay, this simply amounts to each lower bound being less than or equal to each upper bound. That's the same thing. Okay, and infeasible otherwise. Otherwise meaning if the inequality reverses with strict inequality. Okay. Okay. Now, 
is the part that I did not mention at the very beginning. We've actually gone through all this stuff verbally. Now there's some notation added to it. Now what do you do? Suppose you've, you concluded that the uh, beta i are greater or equal to zero for i no, in uh, i in i naught, and this maximum lower bound is less than or equal to the minimum upper bound. So there's a feasible solution. What do you do after this? You just recognize that there's a feasible solution, but what is the solution? That's the question. The qu uh, and that can be easily resolved by doing the following. If I give a name to this, call this, for example, the minimum here, let's call it, say, upper bound u. Okay, it's just a constant. And let's give a name to this, call it the lower bound, say, L, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So, we have the following situation. Xn is between some upper bound u and some lower bound L, where u is greater or equal L. And the remaining constraints don't make any difference, so I don't really deal with them at this point. Okay? Why don't they make any difference? Because whatever I value I assign to x n, zero times that will give you zero. And zero is less than or equal to beta i already by assumption. Okay? So we've got this system. That whole thing reduces to that in the feasible case. What do you do? This is just an interval defined by the numbers L and U. It's not an open, it's, a, uh, it's not an empty interval. So you just pick a value for that, for, uh, for Xn in that interval. So you pick a value. Call it whatever you want to call it. Let's, let me just call it x m bar. Okay. Once you pick that value, you go back to all the previous systems you obtained along the way. So, for example, when you go back to the previous system, x n was a variable in that system. You just substitute the value of x n bar in that system. So, just the immediate predecessor system to the last one involved only two variables. Xn itself plus maybe Xn minus 1, for example. Okay? So, once you have a value for that system for Xn, you've got only one remaining variable to solve for. You just solve for it using the same ideas here. Okay? And then once you've got the two variables on hand, you've got numerical values for both, you go back to the immediately preceding system to the penultimate one, the one, ne the one next to the last one, okay? Two systems before, okay? And you substitute to those two variables and you solve for xn minus two uh, or three, whatever, three and so on and so forth. You just go work your way back upwards until you finally come to the original system where everybody x2 through xn are already known and you solve for x1. So, this is the back substitution part of the solution system. It's similar to the Gauss-Jordan elimination, or not Gauss-Jordan, but Gaussian elimination. You have a lower triangular matrix and then you do back substitution to get the solutions, and that's what we're doing, essentially. Okay? It takes a long time to explain all this, but the concepts are not really too difficult. Let's just uh, apply the ideas here to a numerical system. Any questions before I start doing the example? By the way, this is only for linear inequality systems. There is no objective function here. There is no minimization or maximization. Nevertheless, I'm going to apply the idea to a optimization, a linear programming problem with, you know, it's a simple one, uh, with a minimization type of objective function. Let's see how we can do that. Okay. Okay. 
So suppose we want to minimize minus x1 minus 3x2 subject to x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 6 minus x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 8 and x1 and x2 greater or equal 0. That's a simple linear program. In two variables, you can immediately solve it using graphical procedures. But we will use fourier matzkin elimination. So I'm going to transform this system by defining a third variable here, which is the value of the objective function. So z is equal to minus x1 minus 3x2. And I'm going to rewrite the equations or the problem in this form. Minimize z subject to, in fact, let's make this inequality. So forget the equality, just erase the, inequ uh, the equality. Let's just minimize z, where z is at least as large as your objective function. Like that. Okay, subject to these constraints. And I converted all the inequalities into less than or equal to form. In essence, I've got three variables. Z for fixed value gives you a certain right-hand side, and you want to find a feasible solution to that. And the value you look for for Z is the smallest Z value, such that when you pick that on the right side, the variables still allow you to construct a feasible solution. Okay? The smallest Z for which there is a feasible solution. That's what we're looking for. Okay. How much time do we have? Oh, we have some time. Okay. So, how do we do this? Let me just rewrite it in the following form. By changing Z here and writing it this way. Okay. I don't know if that's the best way, because in this case, I cannot really eliminate z. You can see that. And so you want to leave it to the very end, actually. Uh, so it might as well be appropriate to keep it here. So we'll see how we can handle that. But we'll typically eliminate x1 and x2 and leave z at the very end okay, to solve for. And I'm going to obtain a lower bound for z and an upper bound. Of course, I'm interested in minimizing z, so I, I will choose the lower bound. Okay? That's what I want to do, if there's an upper bound. There will be a lower bound, I'm sure, for sure. Okay. So, if you want to eliminate x1, what do you do? Well, you do what I described to you, which is the same thing as, let's just write this down. The first one will give you minus x1. Let me put this on the right side. Otherwise, I get confused. Uh, OK, so the right side will be z minus plus 3x2. And then I'm going to divide both sides by minus 1. So x1 will be left here, and x1 will be greater or equal. 1 over minus 1, so it will be minus and minus. The first inequality is like that. Do you feel too hot here? Is it too warm? Maybe we should open a window, please. Yeah, 
because some people seem to be sort of, you know, <laughs> not breathing sufficiently. I can feel that. Huh? Okay. The second one gives you x1 being less than or equal to 6 minus x2. Okay? The third one, x1 being greater or equal, what is it? Uh, minus, so minus 8, minus 2, x2. That's it, right? Ah, because it's on the right side, yes. It's a plus. Uh -huh. This is difficult. <laughs> Uh, difficult in uh, actually implementing the method. I do it in a different way by simply <coughs> computing these coefficients that I talked about. But before that, I just want to illustrate one thing here. The last one is x1 greater or equal 0. And also we have 0 times x2. Uh, sorry, 0 times x1 minus x2 less than or equal to 0. This is the last one, OK? So this belongs to the plus set. This belongs to the minus set. That one belongs to the plus set, plus. And that one belongs to the 0 sets, OK? Okay, you require each upper bound to be greater or equal to each lower bound. So what do you require? You take the first lower uh, upper bound. No, first lower bound. Minus z minus 3x2. And there's only one upper bound here. Right? That should be less than or equal to 6 minus x2, which will simplify. And then the same lower bound. Uh, sorry, there's no upper bound, so I don't need to do that. Let's take this lower bound, minus 8 plus 2x2, less than or equal to 6 minus x2. And this one is a lower bound of 0. So this should be less than or equal to the upper, uh, upper bound. And finally, we've got this. So I paired up each of these lower bounds with the single upper bound here. That's all I did. Okay. Now, what does this simplify into? Minus 2x2. We've got 6 on the left, on the right. 6 plus z. That's what you've got. This one, that becomes a 3x2. And we've got 6 plus 8 is 14. That's it. This one, x2 less than or equal to 6. And finally, minus x2 less than or equal to 0. So I've got, this is my system number 2. System number 1. Where's my system number 1? This is my number one system. This is my number two. Now what do I do? I eliminate x2 by pairing up each, negatively co each negative coefficient with each positive coefficient. So when you do that, you get the following. First of all, from the first one, we get x2 greater or equal uh, minus 3 minus 1 third 
z, right? If I make a mistake, please point, point it out so I will make the correction. One over two. See? I know I, I, I would make a mistake with numbers. The second one, x2 is less than or equal to 14 thirds. The next one is x2 is less than or equal to 6. The next one is minus x2 less well, x2 greater or equal 0. So I'm going to pair up the lower and upper bounds. And when you do that, what do you get? You should pair up this lower bound, minus 3, minus 1 half, z, with this bound. So this is the first one we're doing. That's one equal to 14 thirds. Okay. The next one is, there's another lower bound here, which is 0. So let's pair that up with that one. That simply tells me 0 is less than or equal to 14 thirds, which is fine. It's automatic. Well, it's trivially true. Then we take the next lower bound, which is 0. So I go 0 on the left. And sorry, we take uh, still. How do we do this? OK, OK. I'm going to use this now. So first, we take this one. Let's just do that one. Minus 3 minus 1 half z less than or equal to 6. And finally, this one. 0 less than or equal to 6. These two, you may forget about them because they are trivially, trivially satisfied. This one gives you, what does it give you if you leave z alone? I don't know, multiply by 3 or multiply by 2. What is this? It's going to be z greater or equal 14 thirds plus 3. And then I'm going to divide by minus 1 half, which means I am multiplying by minus 2. And then I reverse the inequality. Okay. This one, nothing. This one, what does it give me? It gives me z being greater or equal 6 plus 3 times minus 2. And z on the left. So z has two lower bounds. Which one is the larger one here? I don't know. I have no idea. They are both negative. This one is how much? 14 thirds plus 9 thirds, that's 23 thirds times 2 minus 6 thirds, 46. Minus 46 thirds, that's how much you got here. This one is 9 times, that's minus 18. No, 9, yeah, minus 18. Which one is uh, the largest upper, the largest bound here? The top one. So. The optimal value for z is minus 46 thirds. Okay. Now, once you have this, you go back to the, so this is your third system. You substitute minus 46 thirds here. And then you solve for x2. What do you get? I don't know. You have to go ahead and do it, actually. But I'm sure you can do it. Okay? I've got the solution somewhere. I've got x2 equals 14 thirds, and x1 equals 4 thirds. So when you solve, you get x2 equals 14 thirds, x1 equals 4 thirds. And these will be uniquely defined in the inequalities that they are involved in. Okay? You might want to carry that out. All right, let's take a 10 minute break now so you can start breathing. <laughs> Some of you seem to be a little bit out of shape here. Huh?
that the system of the form AX less than or equal to B, including non-negativity and whatever, all kinds of inequalities. Let's just assume you have n variables and whatever number of uh, inequalities in the initial system. What you do is you eliminate variables one at a time. So you take, the, say, the first variable, and then you do some operations on the first variable, on the coefficients of the first variable, to obtain a second system, which involves only the set of variables from x2 up to the last one. So the first one is gone. And then you do similar kinds of operations for the second variable. And then you obtain a third system, which is again reduced by 1. It involves only variables x3 through the last one. So you just keep going like this, as long as, of course, uh, the system you obtain, the last system you obtain, allows you to continue. And then, finally, you end up with inequalities involving a single variable. Now, once you have a single variable system, and if, uh, if you've got all inequalities, it's easy to solve that. What do you do? It will involve, each inequality will correspond to either an upper bound on the variable or a lower bound on the variable, depending on if the coefficient in front of the variable is positive or negative, okay? So you just take all the upper bounds, you take all the lower bounds. Of the upper bounds, the smallest one is the effective one. Of the lower bounds, the largest one is the effective one. And then you see if the smallest of the upper bounds is larger or equal to, larger than or equal to the largest of the lower bounds, okay? If this is satisfied, then there's room for x, the last variable, to have, uh, to take on a numerical value. If this is not the case, if its effective upper bound is smaller than its effective lower bound, obviously it's empty. There is no solution for the last variable. So you can conclude the case when there is no feasible solution to the initial system. Uh, by doing this, by, uh, by just simply inspecting the last system involving the last variable. If that one admits a feasible solution, then, of course, the, uh, the former systems that you've obtained along the way, they also admit a solution, including the initial one. If the last one does not admit a feasible solution, depending on the uh, 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 bounds, then in that case, of course, the initial system does not admit a solution either, okay? So that's the idea. But how do we proceed about this? I'm going to illustrate that uh, with a numerical example, but first we'll talk about the general way of attacking these things. This is, in a sense, similar in spirit to the Gaussian elimination, except that or Gauss-Jordan elimination. The Gaussian elimination is used for systems of equations. Now, equations are quite different in their nature uh, from inequality systems. When you've got equations, you can take Okay, let's begin. Uh, first of all, today is the Valentine's Day. Sevgililer günü. So, happy Valentine to you all. I hope you spend your life with someone that you love. There used to be no such days, but I guess the capitalist world tries to uh, consume a lot. Of <laughs> just to promote consumption. Uh, they just invent these days, in my judgment. Nevertheless, it's good to, of course, be with, uh, with your loved ones. Uh, the uh, lectures that we're uh, holding this semester, they are, they are being put into the uh, video section of the website of Bilkent. So the first two weeks are already in. 
in case you miss something and if you want to review the lecture you can take a look at it okay I should also take a look at it and see what I look like in the pictures I hope I look okay all right, uh, I guess today uh, we're going to talk about the fourier matskin elimination. That, that's something that I told you that I would talk about last week, except that we did not have enough time for that in discussion of the requirement space. The fourier matskin elim elimination For example, in Gaussian elimination, you can take one variable, say the first one, express it using the first equation, for example, in terms of the remaining variables. And then whatever you've got for x1 in terms of the remaining variables, you take that expression, substitute it in the remaining equations wherever you see your x1. So this way, you eliminate x1 from the entire system by using one of the equations. Of course, you cannot do the same thing here because we substitution will not work here, okay? That's why you have to work with bounds uh, at the end. Well, along the way, actually, you also work with bounds, uh, even though people don't recognize that that's the case, but I'm going to uh, point that out as we go along. So, this is the system. Suppose, we want to eliminate x1 from this system and we want to obtain a new system say a prime x in the remaining variables x prime one of them is eliminated less than or equal to b prime in general when you do these eliminations the number of inequalities on hand will grow in size will grow in number in fact they grow quite fast exponentially many of these inequalities could be or will be in general redundant but we're not interested in that right now we're not interested in computational efficiency as far as computational efficiency this is not an efficient method however it's a conceptually good method and it's good for uh, anyone working on linear programming to be familiar is initially discovered by Fourier, the well-known Fourier of the Fourier transforms. This was back in 1820s, and I think it was 1823 as far as I remember. Could be a little bit different. And this was a way of solving, obtaining a solution to linear inequality systems. Then Fourier did not really, well, he just developed the method and he published it. Uh, it's a two-page two note. It's, it's not really something terribly difficult. He just gives out the main ideas without really going into deep uh, theoretical analysis. It was forgotten for quite a while in 1935 or so. Matzkin, another uh, well-known mathematician, almost rediscovered it or revived it. So that's why we use the term Fourier Matzkin rather than just Fourier. Okay, it was independently conceived of uh, by Matzkin as well. Uh, there are some papers on this. Actually, quite a few papers. Uh, if you want to, you know, do some research on this later on for whatever reason, you just come and see me and I can probably uh, direct you to some of the papers. Now, what's the idea? The idea behind all of this is the following. If you have a linear inequality,